On today's Story Beat, what would you say are the most important lessons you've perhaps taken from directors that you continue to use to this day? Uh, when you're asked to do something or try something, you say yes. Mm. Like, try it. You don't all, you don't put up the stop sign right away. Like, oh, I wouldn't do that. My character wouldn't do that. What's my motivation? You know, they're there to do a job and you might not agree with it, but you gotta try it. And sometimes you're surprised. This is Story Beat with Steve Cuton, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuton. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, Karen Ziemba, has appeared in 11 Broadway shows. Her Broadway debut was in a chorus line as Diana Morales. Later, she played Peggy Sawyer, the lead in 42nd Street. Other Broadway roles include Polly Baker in Crazy For You, Roxy Hart in Chicago, and Belle Hagner in Teddy and Alice. Karen has been nominated for four Tony Awards, once for Best Actress in a Musical for Steel Pier, and three times for Best Featured Actress in a Musical for Curtains, Never Gonna Dance, and she won the Tony for Contact in 2000 for her performance as the timid, abused mafioso's wife. She returned to Broadway in 2014 in the musical adaptation of Woody Allen's Bullets Over Broadway as the character Eden Brent. For various theater performances in New York City and around the country, Karen has also received Drama Desk, Outer Critics Circle, Princess Grace Foundation, Bay Area Theater Critics, and Joseph Jefferson Awards. Karen has appeared on TV's Madam Secretary, The Good Wife, Elementary, Law and Order's SVU and Criminal Intent, Scrubs, the Kennedy Center Honors, and PBS's Great Performances. For more, please visit KarenZiemba.com. For all those reasons and many more, it's a deep honor and a real privilege for me to welcome the exceptionally talented Karen Ziemba to Story Beat today. Karen, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Steve. It's great to be here. Well, I'm so glad you are joining me today. So let's go back in time. Tell us a bit about your history. I know you've been a hoofer forever, um, but, but yes. when did it my start? Mother wanted, my mother wanted to be a dancer, and but uh, her circumstances, if that didn't work out, she had kids, boom, 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 uh, uh, back in the, the 60s and 70s. Yeah. She, so she was raising children, but I was the only girl in the family. I have three brothers. And uh, so she um, got me into ballet and tap, all the things that she loved. She loved a movie musical, so she loved Eleanor Powell, and she loved Leslie Caron, and she uh, and Sid Charisse. And I think that she wanted to do that kind of thing, but she gave it to me. Did, did, so, did, did she, did she yeah. live vicariously through you? Did she... Watch well, everyone? Maybe a little bit. She d did bring me to to see the the local ballet company, the local high school musicals that were in town, so I could see live theater. And as I got older, um, for my birthday each year, my my father would bring me downtown to the Fisher Theater, where they my folks had season tickets to see a show. And uh, so I I had a, I had a pretty good uh, um, idea of what the theater you know the live theater was uh like but i didn't really know the the ins and outs of it i just was looking up at the stage going oh wow that's really cool you it know? was it was you were awestruck by it like many yes of course yes yeah of course and that's the way it was for me too awestruck at a young age mm -hmm. um so who, who early on were your artistic and creative heroes who did you look up to and say wow i think i'd really like to be like so and so well, for us uh, living in suburban Detroit, it was mostly dancing around the living room to LPs mm -hmm. and uh, listening to, you know, oh, you know, Julie Andrews, Mary Martin, Judy Garland, uh, Shirley MacLaine, uh, and then watching movies, of course, you know, Fred, Fred Ginger movies and, and Gene Kelly. And so watching the, the Golden Age movie musicals and then also listening to the LPs of the Broadway cast albums. So as you got a little older, when did you think to yourself, this is something that I really want to do? I'm really going to focus on this. Well, I, because my mother got me into dance class very early, like around six years old, and I started ballet, uh, and then she got me in, 
uh, got me in, into tap uh, dancing, it was sort of like a, a natural progression, and I really took to it like a duck to water. I mm -hmm. loved to dance. And got a lot of attention that way, you know. It was one of those things, kind of competing with my brothers for attention. And uh, <laughs> but I loved it, and I loved music. Uh, so I just, I just excelled at it. And then as I got older, um, I joined a local ballet company, and then I became more serious about classical ballet. And so I thought that I wanted to be a concert dancer for a long time, even though I had sung all my life in chorus and corral and I played a little piano so I was very musical that way vocally but I really loved the dance so I went more in that direction and then as that you know I went to uh, college for dance and then I it, as that kept going on I realized no I don't really just want to be a concert dancer I want to be in musical theater because I wanted to express myself a little bit more broadly sure and I could do that you know telling jokes and singing songs and falling on my face and all that kind of stuff where the ballet world was a little bit more focused and, uh, or too focused for me, I should say, not as, um, uh, there were, weren't as many facets. You kind of had to be in this line. You had to look this way. You had to you know, be this thin. You had to, it just wasn't, it wasn't in, in my wheelhouse. Uh, I, I, I personally think the musical theater is much more fun than the ballet, but that's just my own personal taste. However, having that great training, catapulted me into work because I could not only, you know, tap dance, I did ballet, I did gymnastics, so I could do all the flips and car. I mean, I, and plus I could sing. I was very confident singing because I'd sung all my life, not only in the living room, but in school and church. So it all kind of came together. And when I got into the musical theater professionally, it was at a time when they were really making casts smaller. Mm -hmm. you know, four girls and four guys doing all the ensemble, all the small roles in like summer stock productions. And, and so I was able to fill, fill those, that, those tracks. So to speak. About, about how old were you when you made that decision that this, you want to make this turn to be in musical theater versus ballet, about how old? I would say it was like, at, just as I was getting out of college. Um, uh, so that would be like 18, excuse me, 18, like 2021. 20, I see. So you had, you had actually been through uh, an advanced education at that point and really had a, an, yeah. an understanding done, of it. I had done two musicals in high school, however, because the they did at my high school in Farmington Hills, Michigan, they were doing a production of West Side Story and they wanted a Maria who could do her own dream ballet. Mm. It's usually not done that way in right. a traditional production, but they didn't have many da uh, dancers of my caliber in the school. So they said, you know, Karen, would you audition for this? And because I could hit the notes and I could also do the ballet, I got the part. Then I had dark hair. <laughs> and my mother could sew my costume. She made my costumes for me too. Did, did you did you at that point go to New York? Was it right away? No, I went after uh, went after college. After I got my degree in dance and then I said, nah, I don't want to do that. I thought maybe I'd maybe get a master's and, and teach, but no, I, I, I wanted to perform. So And that's that's when you went to New York and tried your hand. Correct. And how long was it before you got a chorus line? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I, I didn't have my union card when I got to New York. So it was a year of, you know, waitressing, usher, ushering, and uh, auditioning for non-union theater. And then I got, what, what was my first union job? Oh, I got um, a production, a, a, a little touring, summer touring production of My Fair Lady in the, the ensemble. And uh, that's what it, how it all started. Hmm. From then on. And then I just kept and, it was mostly smaller productions. I didn't, I didn't go to Broadway. Uh, I didn't do a chorus line until like the oh uh, well, it didn't take that long, I guess, because that was like 1982, 1982. Yeah, so it was a yeah. I was I was a uh, I wouldn't say floundering, but I was doing a lot of different things for about three years, and then. I uh, auditioned for a chorus line. And, and, and I assume once you got in a chorus line, things just sort of turned into a profession for you. Yes, uh, that actually I started on one of the tours of a chorus line. And when you do that show, you have part of the deal is that you have to learn other characters. There's everybody covers somebody usually. Sure, sure. Like I'm sure in the original production, Donna McKechnie and Kelly Bishop did not cover other roles. But if you were maybe 
playing like a smaller role in the show, you also covered the Cassie role, or if somebody got injured, or you covered Sheila, or you got... So I was cast as um, Maggie Winslow, who sings at the ballet. Yes. And, but I also had to cover Cassie, Deanna Morales, B B and B.B. Bensonheimer, those three characters. So after I did the tour, and they needed somebody on Broadway to fill in for a month as Deanna Morales, guess who was available? <laughs> Me. It's Kid Siemba, she was in that she was in that show across the road that, across the alley that failed to bring her in. Like the Emperor. No, that was the second time I went back to Chorus Line. That's another thing. I'm getting confused now. Uh, but yes, my so uh, I was ready to jump into that. It was it was uh, very daunting and wonderful at the same time. And I assume it was very fulfilling to do it. Yes. Oh yes, and and then I just continued on in that production as one of the people that are in the beginning of the show that get cut and then sing in the booth to enhance, you know, the big musical numbers. And I went on in different roles as needed. Huh. And, and plus and, I played all those different characters that I was, you know, a, you know, perfect employee. Well, well, yeah, you were the go-to person for anything that was screwed up. As were others. Yes. Well, that's, that's smooth with me. <laughs> when you, you know, that's interesting for the listeners to pay attention to when you are, when you make yourself invaluable to a production, it's very hard for them to let you go. That's right. Among other things. I mean, that's, that's true. You, you gotta, <laughs> you know, cover your bases as it were, right? Yeah. Uh, you better cover your bases and, and, your bases and show up on time. You will be okay. <laughs> it, it's very, it's very easy to remove people from a show. So you don't want to be in that position. You want to make yourself be absolutely worth worthy to them in some way. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that that's, that's very valuable uh, advice for someone who's trying to find their way into a career. Um, all right. So when you begin to work on a role, when you've actually gotten a role, we'll talk about auditioning in a moment, but when you've actually gotten a role, aside from reading a script, which is, or libretto, which is the first thing that you'll get, I assume, or the songs, what is your approach? How do you develop a character? Where do you start? Well, a lot of it has to do with um, where's the person from? How old is the person? What is their, uh, you know, their background? Uh, who were their parents? Who who were their siblings? Backstory. What is their, yeah, their backstory. Then it's about what do they want? What do they need? What are they looking for? What, are, what is their goal? Uh, how, how do they react around others? Uh, do you keep a notebook? Do you take notes? What do you do? No, not really. Uh, if you, sometimes I do. If it, when we're talking with the director, of course I would, you know, in a in a session, definitely take down notes. But as far as what I'm going to do, the minute I step up into the arena, so to speak, or into the rehearsal room to to play or to read opposite somebody or to do a scene or even to do dance, to dance with somebody else or dance by myself, it's you have to allow so much which, what is within you just all of a sudden to come out. Well, obviously every, I, I think it's obvious, may not be obvious to everyone, but I think it's obvious that when you create a role, a lot of that role is written and you have to, just like you're talking about, you've got to go looking for the backstory, but a certain amount of it is you. You've got to bring you to it. That's all you got. That is your, that is the, the temple there's with which so, you work. Right. And there's so many different facets of our personalities and our emotions that we have all within us that we can tap. And it's, and as for me, as, as I've gone, gone through my career, it gets richer, it gets fuller. I become a more um, realized person as I age. Mm. So that all just feeds into how much, how much of a deep well you have to, to pull up and pull the stuff up in the bucket and, and use it. You know, what do we got here? Oh, let's try this, you know? And, and also too, there's that, that in, you know, when you think of it as yourself, but there's so much too that you get from others in listening and not only listening to the people who are directing you or, choreogra or choreographing on you, but the, your fellow performers too. How, how important is listening for people on stage? <laughs> it's everything. It's everything. Even if you're moving around and you're and you're like swaying back and forth to somebody who's singing, you may must. It's a, it's about focus, and it's not only about listening to somebody when you're just talking or having dialogue, but when you're even dancing behind somebody or with somebody, it's you have to be so 
clued into them to give them the focus because then it just makes you look better. It makes the whole story be told better. Isn't that an interesting aspect of, of performance that when you pay attention to the other characters, it makes you better. I, I think that's just fantastic. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, uh, what would you say are the most challenging things that you go through when you're developing a character? What is the, what are the things that you have always gone, well, this is the hill I have to climb. I would say probably, you know, it's always about just digging deeper and also leaving yourself alone more as opposed to thinking, now, what would I do now? How do I look? How would I, the more you dig in and feel and allow yourself to let, let something happen, the better, as opposed to trying to create, you know, some kind of character or create, I mean, I'm not saying you don't create it and you don't, especially if it's somebody who's like far away from who you are in real life, but it, it comes from a very, it, it comes from inside first and how you, uh, it's all, all about what story you're trying to tell. And it just because, you know, you have a smile on your face and, and, and you and it might be cute. You could still be a villain or you could still be the bad girl. Oh, for sure. Like you're manipulating or something is, uh, so there's so many different ways of approaching uh, something. Are, are you saying you like to let the role come to you in your, in your development? And hopefully, yes, if you have enough time to allow that to happen. And I think it really, if you're fortunate, you get a chance to play it for a while. So you, it, it evolves and gets, like I said, gets richer and changes. Mm -hmm. and you still got to hit your marks and you still got to be standing in the right place for the light to hit you. Or Absolutely. To, somebody's kicking their leg over your head if you got a duck or whatever that is. But as far as the, <laughs> the, the more confident you get in the movement and in the, and the dialogue and what you're saying, and you, it, it just, then all the other stuff can, can bubble up and become much more connected. So, much so, so have you worked on parts that you had a hard time finding? Has that how it happened for you where it was like really a challenge to find? I, you know, I'll admit that when I went into Chicago to play Roxy Hart, uh, of course, it had been originated by the great Gwen Verdon, mm -hmm. played by many great women, you know, Anne Ryan King and Liza Minnelli. And, uh, and it was the sort of a sort of uh, lady that I hadn't done a lot of those kind of ladies, those very selfish uh, ego, egocentric, uh, um, entitled bad girls, but with a heart of gold, of course, but sort of like, you know, clueless in some ways, like manipulative, but sort of clueless too. And, uh, it took me a while to get into that. And, uh, I mean, the dancing and the singing, that was all like, that was not a problem. It was finding her and being willing to be that entitled uh, and very selfish woman. This is 180 degrees from who you are in real life. Well, I'm not saying that I'm the Lisa. I mean, I can be selfish too. I mean, you don't live with me, so you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody has their, their moments and their, and their peccadillos. But uh, yes, that was, that was, a, I had to work at that one. I mean, uh, so, and it got, it got better. And I had some wonderful conversations with Anne Ryan King. She helped me so much. Uh, just by giving me some images and uh, can, can you give us an example of an image she gave you that was helpful? Yes, I can. She said uh, that Roxy was the girl who would say, I don't want to go to the prom. I don't want to do this. I want this. I want that. She, she wanted me to make her like a little girl, mm. a selfish little entitled, a young entitled girl, as opposed to this woman who had been through it because she wasn't, she wasn't educated. All she knew was, you know, it's like somebody who doesn't know any way to discipline somebody except by like being violent or hitting them or yelling at them. So right? someone who has never matured, basically. Sort of. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. And uh, she, what she wants, she wants it now and she'll do whatever she can to get it. And, and I sort of knew that about her, but uh, it, my own personality, my own kind of persona was coming out more. My sunny personality was coming out a little bit more <laughs> than this other kind of very, uh, had, a little, had more guile. And Dar more, darker than you. 
Yes. And so that one took me a little bit, of, a little bit of time. I mean, just because I was wearing black lace and, you know, black stockings and high heels, it didn't, it, the clothes helped, but you really, that's the one that I had needed to dig a lot deeper. Mm, interesting. And over time, I got a chance to play it for a while. It really helped. It really helped. And by the time you were at the end of that run in, in the show for you, I assume it was a part of you at that point. Yes, it was. It she she had evolved. Yes. <laughs> well, that's a that's a beautiful thing. What yeah. I, ask, I ask lots of guests this question, which is, in your case, it's it's all character stuff. You're always looking for a part that has great character depth of some kind. Mm -hmm. What is it for you that makes a great part great, or makes a great show great? What is it for you that that you go, yeah, I I really can sink my teeth into that. I think it's a big pie and when pieces of the pie are missing it's lesser than obviously that's you know maybe a strange way of putting it but a show for example like gypsy i've done i've done mama rose and gypsy mm -hmm. you've already got this incredible piece of theater for sure now of course mama rose is like the pentultimate character in that story but without that music, that book, that story, those characters that were created, it wouldn't be quite as cheerce, so to speak. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just this beautiful piece, great piece. I mean, it, it starts with the overture. It's, and then you've got this great, this person who just, she knows what she wants and she does whatever she, now that's another one. You know, had I not played Rocky's Heart, maybe then when I played Mama Rose, she, that probably fed into that performance. That makes sense. Uh, Mama, uh, Mama Rose is domineering. Yes. And, and, and she's going to do whatever she can. And she says it's because of the love of her kids. And yes, it is because, but it's because she's missing something in, inside of her that she never got to experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She still is looking for that. She's still searching for that. And back to what you were saying, though, uh, asking is that the show itself buoys your character. Contact is another experience of mine. Yes, okay, I won the Tony for Contact. That role was created for me. She was wonderful. And so there was so much about that character that was me, and yet also I had to then take left turns and become somebody else, become like a little evil in some parts of that. But it was the show the contact the entire evening that was so moving and funny and delightful and eye-opening and you know it was it, it, that it just buoyed my performance mm -hmm. like you could do a great performance in a show but if the show is really good too wow you know it's, well, that... it makes it all that much better and that's again what i'm saying about the, the theater it's just like it's there's those pieces of the pie if they're missing it's okay but it could be so much great. Well, the, as I I've been teaching screenwriting for a long time, and one of the things that we teach in terms of storytelling is is that structure, which is what you're really referring to, structure is the definition of it is the relationship of the pieces and parts to each other and to the whole. And if that everything does not blend together into one uh, cohesive whole, this show is not going to stay together. That that's what you're talking about is that you you're looking for where the show itself is all integrated into one thing essentially essentially yes i think that's very 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 smart to to look at it that way um are there over time have there been parts that you've been offered or went up for and then thought this is not right for me and you just avoided well there are some that i uh have turned down just because i didn't necessarily want to go out of town for a year or something like that and then right. later i kicked myself and say gosh i could have put that money away <laughs> you know? it's like what it should have could have but uh I, you know i find something really really positive in every single show i do even mm. the ones that aren't successful and there are also some disappointing things in them too what, what, that you learn from what what would you say has been disappointing in your life that you then learn from that you grew from oh gosh so many things uh can you pick a one? Oh. Uh, well, Steel Pier, for example, Steel Pier was this, I mean, you couldn't have asked for a better, you know, a better cast and crew and the people, the, the, the team that worked on that show. But it was like, we never got a chance to go out of town and work on it and uh, see what we had. It was an original 
idea based and um, not necessarily adapted, but based on a lot of many different kind of stories that they kind of compiled, but it was an original, a really an original story. When you have an original musical like that, you really need the time. And I didn't think we had the time to figure out, oh, maybe that's not so right, or this is confusing, or this. And uh, we really needed time with that. So I, it, and that was my first original role in on Broadway. So to for that not to be a success, or at least not to have more time with it, at least for it to run for, I don't know, a year maybe, or nine months, we didn't even get that much time. And that was, that was Candor and Ebb, right? That was Candor and Ebb, Candor and Ebb. I mean, come on. Uh, it was just glorious, but it, what, there were parts of it that was, I, I, uh, you know, it felt was, like, it felt like it got away because it, it, it wasn't fully realized because it didn't have the time to, to grow I that way. So. I think that's part of it. Yeah. And uh, I think most people that, that are even in the theater don't understand how long it takes to develop a show to the point where it's really right for a Broadway stage. Mm -hmm. Um, there are lots of shows that get produced that never make it to Broadway that are fine shows, but they're not Broadway ready for one reason or another. Right. And when right. you have a Candor and Ebb or a Stephen Sondheim or a Stephen Schwartz or something like that, then you know you're trying to get to Broadway with it. Mm -hmm. And it should be allowed its time to to mm -hmm. uh, to, to materialize, I guess would be mm -hmm. a way to say it. Um, all right, let's, I want, I'm curious about your audition toward, your, I mean, your philosophy rather, toward auditioning. How, when you have auditioned, what is your philosophy toward it? How do you look at auditioning? It never gets easy for me. I mean, I know some people say like, oh, I just like pretend I'm auditioning them. And I go in there and say, hey, I can't do that. I, you know, sit out outside of a room when I'm waiting to go into a room to, to meet a casting director or a, a group of, you know, a creative team. And I'm very nervous. And I, I but I, try to isolate myself and really be focused. And um, the thing is, is when you're at an audition, it hasn't happened in a while because of, of the pandemic, of course. Sure. But course. when you are in like a hallway sitting with other actors and you're up for the same parts or other people are auditioning for other shows and it's noisy and people are stretching and people are tapping their feet, it's, it's, it can be very distracting and you must focus, focus, focus is everything. Because the minute you open the door, that's when your audition starts, not when you open your mouth to sing or mm -hmm. you open your mouth to, to do a speech from a play. It's or scene. It's uh it's who you are and how you comport yourself. So I think people forget that odd part of auditioning is the people looking at you or deciding whether they want to work with you beyond just your talents. Do yeah. we want to spend time with this person? Mm -hmm. So that's what the comportment is. Yeah, you can't come in with the weight of the world on your shoulders because these people want to hire you. They want you to be the one. You have to give them that much credit that this is going to be it. I mean, unless there's somebody in there with things, oh, I know her, I don't like her. <laughs> so like they might already have like pre <laughs> pre-existing conditions. <laughs> So uh, I can't imagine anybody sitting out in an audience looking at you and thinking, I don't like her. That can't, that <laughs> well, can't yeah. be, that can't be possible. Maybe I've worked up to that, that point, but thank <laughs> you. Uh, so, but yeah, as you enter the door, that's what happens. And you just got to be prepared and you got to give your music to the pianist or you have to say hello, you know, hello. But I think I find with nervousness sometimes comes too much chatter, too much, I, I know I felt sometimes after auditions, I think, you know, you didn't need to have be so chatty with them. You didn't need to be have to shake everybody's hand. You didn't have to, it's like, just come in and do your, do what you're there to do. Be cordial. And you know, if you know somebody hi, you know, whatever, but it's really about getting that job done mm -hmm. and them doing their job. So do, do you, I, do you settle down once you're on stage and doing your thing or you remain nervous through it? Oh, no, no, definitely settle down. It's, I think that there's a transformation that happens once you're out on a stage. Even for da many dancers, I think, that are maybe have a sore hip or a sore knee. Or so, it's like you sort of forget about it. Mm -hmm. You kind of do it. It's like your body goes into this different mode. It's really fascinating. And, and, the, and the adrenaline kicks in a little bit and you, you just, you're in yep. go mode at that point. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So all right, I want to talk about performing, which you've done an enormous amount of. Um, do you have any sort of um, ritualistic preparation that you go through before you're about to do a performance in, in a fully rehearsed show, you're ready to go on? Uh, yes, I think that it's 
even if you're not like for example the last you know 10 15 years i've done more um straight theater uh, along with doing musicals and i find even so and i'm not singing in the show i feel that a vocal warm up a yoga or stretching sort of warm up the moment you like maybe 10 minutes where you just like meditate and just relax and open yourself up mm -hmm. and of course when you're at your dressing table and you're doing your makeup and you're transforming yourself into whoever you're playing that night that's part of that warm-up but your voice and your body and i think think your body first because your body helps warm up your voice that it's imperative anything physical because it's you need to fill a theater with your presence what what do you have a series of vocal exercises that you always do nothing nothing specific um that i do uh sometimes it's just you know reading something sometimes it's just uh i really do like to sing and do a, a singing vocalise and because that comes naturally to me because i've sung all my life i i like doing that and i think it it really gets it really puts fluidity into your into your speech hmm. and into the nuance of the timbre and everything you, you you work your jaw, your tongue, your lips, and so on, get everything loosened up and ready to go. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, I think that you would have a harder time if you just went out and winged it. I think that that's... Yes, I think when you're when you're in a long run, too, you're so used to it. It's sort of like the back of your end. You just kind of run out there. But I find that when you take the time, even if it's just for you know, 15, 20 minutes prior, you feel so much better. And you're so glad you did. What's, what's the longest you've been in a run? What's the longest you've been on one show? The longest run I ever did was Crazy For You. And I, I say that because I did it for 10 months on the national tour first. Right. Before I came to Broadway. And then I continued on in Broadway until it closed. Wow. That was like over two and a half years. Wow. And part of that was because uh, it was the most one of the most joyous experiences to do that show every night, not only because it was the Gershwin brothers music and, and lyrics, which, you know, they, they, they weren't too shabby. And that, no. but it was fun and it was, it was hopeful and happy and funny. And I, I love the people I worked with. Did, did you, even though you were enjoying it, which clearly, it's hard not to like the Gershwins, you know, um, <laughs> Uh, but even though you were enjoying it, I assume after you've done it for a long period, there it starts to wear on you a little bit, yeah. Or did it never get? Did Sometimes it never get old? Shows do. Yes. Uh, and how do you overcome that? What do you do? Yeah, oh, you just start from you know as if it's the first time you've ever done it, and it's a new audience, and it's again, it's how you relate to everybody else on stage. And there's always, especially in a long run, there's always somebody new on stage because. Mm. You have replacements and there's other things to to capture your attention i don't you know that's a question people ask all the time how do you do those long runs how do you remember all those lines how do you how do you how do you? it's like oh how could you do you know that show contact you know that dancing and there's not much there it's like <laughs> how i felt from day one doing that to how i felt like a year and a half later was like exponential and how i grew and how much more how closer I was to that character and but that's me some people don't like to be with a show more than six months they can't take it they, it's like they get bored I don't get bored well that's important why? I think... I, and it's really hard to explain um I mean I mean there were there was I think there was one I think there was one actor I think it was an actress who was in Cats for the entire run yes and how do you, you know, she must have really loved it. And obviously it was work and you made it. money. Well, there's there's many different reasons why people stay with shows for a long time. Everybody has different stories and different needs. And um, people are putting their kids through college. People are buying a home. People, and also, but I think more than that, even, it's not that those people wouldn't go off and do another show mm -hmm. and be able to work in another show. It becomes extended family. It becomes your family. You're with them six days a week right for a few hours every day so it's like it's work but there's something much more familial about it than just going to an office i think and even there's a family and when you go to the office too but there's something about 
the theater because of the way that you react to each other, the kind of, um, you, you, you're tactile, you are dancing together, you're touching each other, you're hugging, you're, uh, uh, you're gossiping, you're doing all these things, which you do in an office, so it's kind of hard to... to, to well, well, the offices, <laughs> tend, offices tend not to be magical, but the theater <laughs> okay, is there you go. magical. That's the word. It's, why couldn't I think of the word magical? But there's something about the way you connect your backstage and everybody, you know, you go into the into the, the hair room to get a wig put on. So there's that magic there, which is so wonderful. And those people have that craft that they do so well. And there's the costumes and the dressers and the people that you run into and talking to the doorman. There's something about, or door woman, there's something, it's like, okay, now I'm going to see, I'm going to visit my other family for a few hours. Well, also, also when you go to an <laughs> office, you're not going to have some kind of chemical reaction with an audience. There's that too. That's a very good point. Why uh, didn't I think of that? Uh, well, <laughs> I, 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 you know, so, sometimes I get lucky. <laughs> but you're, you're right. You're right, Steve. It's once that music starts and you go out and, and the light hits you and it's quiet out there and you're listening, what's going what's to happen? What's going to unfold? Well, those those last strains of the orchestra tuning before the curtain goes up. I mean, there's just there's something about it. I think probably I've never done a long run in the show. I've never worked on a long run. You obviously have, but my imagination tells me that it's still it still gets your nerves on set set up when you hear those sounds and you smell those smells. There's something about it. Yeah. Speaking of which, uh, when I did a chorus line because I was one of the understudies after I did the Dan Deanne Morales track for a month and then she returned the girl, she had a baby and she came back and I continued to play some of the other roles. During the show, when I'm not singing in the booth or once I've been cut from the beginning, the characters cut from the beginning, I would go down into the orchestra pit, which was covered. Remember it was, I don't know if you remember, but it was, you could not see the orchestra pit because it was supposed to be like it was a, in a rehearsal hall. It was right. Cool. So I went under it and, there was no room at all, but I would like sit down and just being in that orchestra pit. Oh my God, it makes me cry. It's like, that's magical. Mm, indeed. Enveloped by these live musicians. So, and I remember that that orchestra had a harp during the Cassie dance, da 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 da, -da and she'd play the harp. And then the, the trumpets would come. Oh my God. If you have a chance, if you're ever in a show to sit in the pit. I mean, so many pits now are on stage and the, the sometimes the, the musicians are in a different room. Mm -hmm. They're actually down in a pit. But if you ever have the chance during the show, even if it's just for five minutes, just to sit down there. We used to sit in the room where the orchestra was during Bullets Over Broadway and sit in this room with all the musicians, which is also very tight. It was so exciting. Mm. So exciting. Because uh, I had some downtime in that show too. That's that's what you got to do. You got to see how the how. Remember, I talking about all those pieces of the pie in a show that sure come together. Yeah, that's no, th that's something I can't do. I can't sit down with a bassoon or a violin or and, and and play like that. But that's what's making me sound good, and that's what's making everybody else who's up on stage knows. And I'm sitting in the middle of it and just being swept away. It's that's I, that's what's so great about the theater it's all happening at the same time and I, I've, I've had the privilege of interviewing a couple of um composers that also conduct orchestras when they their compositions are recorded and one in particular bear mccreary who's a great tv composer and film composer um he said that he's been spoiled for even live concerts anymore by being a conductor because you're literally the focal point of all the music at one time and it just, it's all live and it's all coming to you. It's all facing you at the same time. So when he goes to a concert, even though it's a live concert, it's not the same for him. Right. So, right. but what you're talking about is most people don't ever get to hear an orchestra that close. No. And it, and it is a different sound. There's something just huge about it. It just fills the, it fills every gap in the air. Mm -hmm. uh, and it and it feels that way. I'm, all right, so you've worked for tons of directors over the years. You've worked for lots of different directors. Mm -hmm. Some you've worked for more than once, like Susan Stroman, the great yes. Susan Stroman. Yes. Um, what would you say are the most important lessons you've perhaps taken from directors that you continue to use to this day? Uh, when you're asked to do something or try something, you say yes. Mm. And you try it. 
You don't all, you don't put up the stop sign right away. Like, oh, I wouldn't do that. My character wouldn't do that. What's my motivation? You know, they're there to do a job. And you might not agree with it, but you got to try it. And sometimes you're surprised. Sometimes they're surprised and they say, nah, you're right, let's not do that. But you have to at least give everybody the chance to make a contribution. That's what collaboration is. Mm -hmm. um, There's something akin to improvisation. The, the work of an Im improvisational actor is they teach to say yes to everything. It's yes and, yes and. That's what you're talking about, isn't it? I guess so. <laughs> It's just to try it doesn't mean you have to live with it, but you should take everything in as an opportunity. Yep. I, I think that that's Even really if it's key. Scary. Even if it's sometimes risky, especially if you're doing if, if you're doing something in the, uh, that has to do with choreography. But well, you don't want to hurt yourself. I no, mean, no. And uh, stuff has been modified for me. Uh, I, I know that in, during curtains, um, Rob Ashford, who's a fabulous choreographer, uh, he had the, uh, the dance assistants uh, uh, demonstrate this pas de deux that I was supposed to do with uh, uh, my leading man in that dance, Noah Racy. And he was throwing her over his back and lifting her up. And she was very... Joanne Hunter, who is now a great choreographer too, she was uh, one of his assistants, one of Rob's assistants. She is a fabulous dancer. She was all over the place, but she's like, you know, five foot three, maybe, <laughs> teeny, teeny, tiny, strong. And he was throwing her around. I said, uh, this guy's not going to throw me around because <laughs> first of all, I'm twice as big as she is. And I wasn't as agile as she was or even as good of a dancer as she is anymore. I mean, it was at that point where I couldn't do that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. I was a little bit nervous. So we tried to do it a couple of times and that it was, I think he hurt his shoulders. <laughs> that was it. But it was like, you know, to watch these people go through this choreography and go like, wow, that's spectacular. But, ooh, I don't know if I can do that. So to your point, yes, you don't want to hurt yourself. That's exactly it. Because you're talking about eight shows a week. Yeah, exactly. Well, you... You've got to be smart about it at any age, at any, whatever you, whatever your type, whatever your physicality is, you've still got to be smart about it. That's right. You can't, you can't do something. I mean, if she's tiny, that doesn't mean you can throw her off the balcony. Um, you, sure. you know, so, I mean, you still have to be smart about it. But she'd try it. She would try it. <laughs> <laughs> can you get from the balcony to stage in one leap? Yes. Let me yeah. try it. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Um, there, was, right, so, there was a kid in, a, in a crazy for you that used to be on the banister of the up the second floor of this the set, and he would jump down Ray Roderick. He jump down and do a, a from the right toward the audience every night. He jumped down. It's like wow. He was he was a former gymnast, but and was, never got hurt. I don't think so. That's amazing. That that is amazing. He was in, he was amazing. <laughs> anyway. So so when you're going into rehearsal on a show, what is it that you want? What are you looking for? What do you want a director to give you during rehearsal? What's important to you? What works for me is uh, really specific imagery, not necessarily a lot of discussion about something. Sometimes when you when you talk a lot about stuff, like when you in in regional theater, we have the advantage of really sitting down and pouring over a script, you know, for the first week, week and a half before we put it on its feet, which is always valuable. Uh, but sometimes when you don't have as much time, it really helps for um, uh, a director to be able to go bam with, with an idea. And you go like, oh, that's great. And if they're really good at it, I, I think to myself, that's a good director who can get their idea out in very few, very little, you know, elaboration. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do know what you mean. It's it's when it's simple and direct. And what you don't want, I think what you don't want to do with an actor is give them multiple things that they need to try and do at one time. It's always better if it's a You're single thing. You're right about that, yes. Yes, um, because all those multiple things will come from this one simple idea. Sure, absolutely. Um, I mean, so, so when you're, if you've given a note, we already said that um, you want to say yes to when an, a director gives you something, even if you disagree with it, mm -hmm. but you've tried it, it doesn't work, but the director keeps trying to get you to go there for some reason. Do you have a way to 
gently move a director off of something? You try, you try, and it doesn't always work. If they, they have an idea of something and they want it to be a certain way, um, and you try to make it work. And you do your best. That's the job. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, you know, some people maybe have more clout than I do and they feel that they can, uh, you know, do it their way and they do it their way. For me, uh, I got other fish to fry. You know, you, I'm back in another scene that's going to work okay. Or, aside from saying yes, are there things that you do now uh, that are very different from when you first started out in the business where, where, you, where you're working with directors? Do you have an approach now that's different aside from just saying yes? Uh, I think it, it, it's in conjunction with saying yes. As you move on in your career, you find different ways to... Uh, describe something in a certain way, why it doesn't work for you, or could we try this because blah, 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 blah. You know, you learn these things um, just from doing the work that, mm -hmm. and doing the work for years, um, how maybe to modify something. Mm -hmm. Because if somebody's just cracking whip saying like, do it, do it, do it, which I've, I've worked in those kind of situations before, uh, you don't really have any, any recourse, but if you can, if you are collaborating closer with somebody in a more um, collegial way, you know, it's, I don't know. It's just a, well, each, each case, each case is different, right? You have to approach each one in its own unique way. Yes. Um, you, you've done both plenty of dramas and plenty of comedies and musical comedy as well. Do you have a preference? Would you rather be in comedy or would you rather do drama or is it just everything is everything? Everything is everything. You like and it all. A little bit of uh, tragedy and comedy, and there's a little bit of comedy and tragedy. And uh... <laughs> however, I will say back to what you were saying about how could you do that show for so long? When a show is it, is hopeful and uh, joyous, it's a lot easier to do a longer run than something that's dark. After a while, playing a dark character, playing um, a pained character, you need a break from it. Did, did that, was that a, 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 the case with Roxy? Not, well, not so much. With, well, I went from that to, into contact and contact that I did for, I did for a long time too, but that contact was a role that uh, I, I finally had to say, I need a break from it because mm. it was, she was a very pained, a wonderful character, but it was, it was a painful character too. And it was time to step aside and do something different. So without getting the least bit personal, it, uh, my assumption is it was beginning to leach into your life in some way. It was making life a little bit. Yes. yes. And it was uh, very physically taxing. It was, it was, it was time. It was grueling and you were ready to move on is what it was. I assume. Uh, um, I, I want to talk for a few moments about your TV work because you've done a fair amount of TV work as well. There are really significant difference between working on a stage and working in front of a camera. Um, what, Explain for those who may not know, what are those significant differences from your perspective and how do you manage that? Well, stillness is important on television. Uh, again, the focus and the, the, the cameraman and director really edit those things. They t most of the shows that I've done, like it's in New York, have been like um, one camera. So they, they switch around and do the scene in many different dimensions many different ways right from his point of view from your point of view close up here <laughs> Me meaning you're repeating you're repeating and repeating right? yes i had a really really good um comments from um the gentleman who was playing the judge when i when i did um yes was the good wife i was at, uh on on the stand i was a very uh very emotionally pained mother who had lost her daughter to cancer and um i was uh, in court because I was blaming the medical uh, staff that had caused this to happen or allowed this to happen. Anyway, Saul, who was playing the judge, said to me, Karen, you don't have to be that emotional for every single take. You should save it for the close-up. <laughs> but I thought to myself, yeah, but what about the people that are listening to me over in the jury box? What about the, you know, the other lawyers? What about... So each time I would like conjure up this emotion. But he was sort of right in that, you know, you learn over time, like, you know, don't give it all away. You're not going to have any left. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really funny. So that's an example that's different. In the theater, you just got to bring it up. 
once a night or, or twice in a day if you got a matinee. Television there, you know, you do enough television, you fit, you, you end up figuring it out. At that moment, when I did that scene on that, in the jury, I mean, in the, uh, the defendant's uh, yeah, box, uh, I just, I, I, I just wanted to you know, put it all out there. And he said, hey, take it easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that I assume that's turned out to be a valuable piece of advice for you. Yes, yes, it has. <laughs> um, so think about it also, you know, I have never done any television where I have where a long running series where I'm playing doing working like every day for mm. many 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 years. So they are like guest spots on an episodic or whatever, and you must go in there really knowing your material because people you're playing opposite they have sheets and sheaves and sheaves of pages you know and they're waiting for you to get it right or what you really have to know it so it is nerve-wracking that way you really want to know your stuff you're, you're jumping onto their moving train exactly and As so you really need to be on your best um money stuff that day i yes i i, I try to be um and it's it, it it can be it can be daunting in that way because you're just jumping in just to do a scene. It has nothing to do with the story that came beforehand. You don't have no idea what was going on. It's you're just kind of plugged in. Well, that can be especially true in one of the Law and Orders because they're they're oh, yeah. somewhat broken up. Yes, and I've done many. So and I've enjoyed them all, but it's yeah. You got they're just... the the Law and Order machine apparently is trying literally making an effort to hire every New York actor they can get their hands on. <laughs> I know when I hear something, oh, I've never done this show. I think, what? Because <laughs> they're based in New York and they yeah. do tons yeah. of New York actors. They bring in yeah. tons of tons of New York actors. Um, all right. Um, do you have any tricks that you use to refresh your well when you are burnt out, when you have gone, you know, you're trying to find a new something? How, what do you do? It's always good to... to uh see other theater to see other musical performances whether even just music performances to go to museums to be in nature to just go away from everything for a week just to jump start the engine i know that when i was with long running shows and i would take a, a long earned vacation uh i always felt so much better when i came back it really did help uh it seems sort of like during this pandemic, a lot of it has been like this sort of long vacation with little fits and starts and a very different way of performing. It's all been, you know, technologically um, different, of course. Well, you know? well, that brings up a great question for me. Um, obviously, we're having this conversation. This show is going to live for a long time on on the website, on the Storybeat website. But right now we're having this conversation after about a year of lockdown on COVID or people being locked away in their homes. Um, so this is not the same as being between a job. This is a sort of an enforced stop for everybody. But when you, in a career that you've had, I'm going to imagine there have been times where you were between gigs. What is, how do you keep yourself going? What do you what is your focus? Do you work on your voice and your body or how do you approach being between? Well, you probably have, I take a little downtime, but you have to continue in this position. You have to keep physically um, as up as much as you can, mm -hmm. like your body, your voice, or you, or you lose it. It's, it's a muscle. You use it or lose it. That's right. It really is a muscle. There's no question. Say, by the way, same thing for writing. Writing is a muscle. You don't write for a long time. You lose that muscle too. It's a mm -hmm. it's a muscle. You have mm. to keep it's 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 a, a, akin to athletics. Well, being what you do is definitely akin to athletics. It's it's very athletic. <laughs> and and so are you and, saying that a writer is what you're keeping your mind facile? Or are you talking just about uh, in what way? Do you well? Mean? So. We, we've turned the tables and now I'm, I know right now I'm interviewing so, you. So, so the, the answer is it's, it's all the above. If you are a writer and you stop writing for a period of time, it doesn't mean that you won't ever be able to write again. It means that you're going to get on, you're going to be rusty. You won't remember how to form sentences in an intriguing, interesting way. You won't know how to, how do I develop this character? You, how do I make the story and the plot work? And the more that you do it, the better you get at it, the more facile mm -hmm. it is for you. Uh, and it's it's akin to 
uh, athleticism or training for athletics. It's not the same at all, but it is akin to it in the sense yeah. that the more you do it, the better you are at it. And I think you can never stop reading either. I mean, oh, for case, absolutely and in my not. Case too. Uh, you, you're a reader. You're a voracious reader. I'm not voracious, but I do it every day, um, whether it be you know, you know, the New York Times in the morning, but always at night uh, before you know, as I'm lulling off. You know, it's having a real book made of paper and that where I turn the pages because those pixels keep me awake. So I'd like to use a real have a real book, whether it's more of the New York Times, but it's usually a book that I'm reading and it just, it gets you out of yourself, but it gets you into what's happening in the world and or somebody else's life that you're reading about or another time. Um, I like, you know, there's always something else to, to, to bite into. What am I going to do for me? Da, 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 da. You know, I, enough of the, you know, Hey, I've, I've cooked every meal every single night for the last year. Yeah. You and me both. <laughs> So if that's that's changed my life in that way. So there's that to think about now. But it's I don't need that much going out of myself to to cook a meal. I suppose like you know read maybe reading some directions or trying what are we going to shop for. But when you read a book, it's it takes you totally, totally out of yourself. I find. And, and that's and that's very useful for both your mental and your physical being. Yes. It's extremely helpful to be able to get away from yourself a little bit, especially when you are in your head, as they say. Mm -hmm. um, well, I've been speaking now f for almost an hour to the incredible Karen Ziemba, and we're going to wind this down now. I'm just curious in all of your many, many experiences, um, do you have a story that you can relate to us that's either weird, quirky, strange, or just maybe plain funny? Well, there's there's a few little things that have happened in the theater, uh, in my life in the theater. Nothing, some some stories that have happened that I w will not share uh, that uh, because it, I don't want to mention any names. No, please but, don't. <laughs> well, that that has to do with people like, like people like might never want to work with again. Those kind of, <laughs> who would you never want to work with again? Well, I'm not going to mention names, but this is what happened. I mean, <laughs> stuff like that. I do have those kind of stories, but. Uh, this is this is not really a funny story, but it's uh, it, this happened not that long ago, actually, when we were doing curtains at the Martin Beck, now called, of course, the Hirschfeld. It was called the Hirschfeld at the time. Beautiful, beautiful theater. And it was in the middle of the summer, I believe. So everything was on, every air conditioner, every computer, and of course, all the theaters, everything is run by computer now. Mm -hmm. And there must have been some kind of a surge, a power surge, I don't know what happened, but our sound gone. Wow. And thank goodness we were in the Hirschfeld Theater, which was built for acoustics. Mm -hmm. We weren't in a, like a new theater that had funky, you know, sound or whatever that needed a sound system. Now, every show needs a sound system now, musical, because most very very often or mostly most of the time, there is some kind of an electronic instrument in the pit, like us like a, a synthesizer that enhances the orchestra. Sure. And so, and, and a lot of these uh, shows now have a rock score or a more pop, pop, pop score. So they use electronic instruments for just for the score, period. Sure, of course. And uh, we didn't have that many, I think we did have a synthesizer in that pit, but anyway, so what happened? All the sound went out. All of a sudden, it's like you couldn't hear anybody. You couldn't hear anybody speak. But it's like, okay, who? This, we se it separated the men from the boys at that moment. It's like we continued on, and we just had to make sure that we we were like kind of the edge of the stage, face front, and putting it out there. But it was like, okay, Z, now you got it. All those voice lessons you took and how you wanted to project your voice and get it out there to that final fifteen hundred seat up there, and it was such an eye opener, a throat opener, but it was an eye opener too. Like, oh my goodness, how much you had to support and really speak. And I was thinking about, you know, the Ethel Mermans and Mary Martins when they didn't have mics and things and they used to just face front and they used to sing and the orchestra was acoustic. So everybody was acoustic and the theaters were all built for acoustics. And it, it just had to go into that mode. And it was, it made me feel really happy to have to do that. That one, it was scary, but it was like, okay, here we go. 
ground yourself and put it out there. Has there ever been anyone with a louder voice than Ethel Merman? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, she was huge. That was a yes. huge, out of a little woman. She was very small. Yes. And that big voice came out. I mean, Bette Midler's there, but not Ethel Merman big. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. All in the mask. Nah. So last question for you. Um, do you have a solid piece of advice or a tip that you can lend to someone who's maybe just starting out and trying to break into the business, or maybe they're in a little bit and they're struggling and they're trying to get to the next level? Well, other than the things that you do just to keep yourself in shape, whether it be your singing, you know, your the the, the theater that you're working on going you know, as many classes, uh, virtual classes that you can do. I, I don't know. It's uh, I mean, I do a Shakespeare salon every Thursday night. What's a, a Shakespeare class. salon. What is that? It's not a class. It's a bunch of wonderful actors that got together. We were invited by this director, Ron Daniels, who is phenomenal. He worked with the RSC, but he, he was my director for a couple of Sweeney Todd productions that I did for opera companies around the country. And we work on Shakespeare and sonnets and all different kinds. And I learned so much. Uh, and I'm one of the people that hasn't done as much sh classical Shakespeare as some of these other people, but they're just incredible to watch and to work with. And his insightfulness, Ron, about an actor bringing this stuff to life. It's, it's, it's been fabulous to do that. But I, that's my kind of class salon that I do while I'm here virtually trying to keep myself going. But I say, other than those things you do to keep yourself in shape, your voice, your body, when you have the opportunity, it's about who you are. Are you the person that somebody wants to keep calling and keep working with and say, oh, get that person. I want to work with that person. And I say, first, the first thing is don't kick anybody in the ass. You never know who you are with in this business that's going to be the next director or casting director or producer or fellow actor on stage. We're all in this together. And there are going to be people that are very annoying that you might need to separate yourself from. And you'll figure that out over time you don't want somebody who sucks the air out of the room all the time you need to be with other people too that want to share the space and if you're fortunate enough like i have been then i have to say you get to work with those people a lot but make yourself the person that doesn't suck the air out of the room but that contributes mm. and even if sometimes it's to say something that other people might not like it's to be truthful in your work and uh and be kind and be generous as an actor. And remember that you never know who these people are that you're working with. And everybody you work with, the person who gets the coffee, the person who is running the messenger, who's bringing in the music, the new music, those people all enhance what you, this final project is going to be. So do not discount them. Well, isn't the, uh, the old expression, uh, be nice to everybody on the way up because you're going to see them again on the way back down? <laughs> <laughs> sort of yes but uh but hopefully it's um you know things will go up and maybe things will plateau you don't necessarily want everything to like fall but you know but f flatness is not as important not as interesting as hills and dales and mountains that you climb and valleys you find you know beautiful you know flowers and vegetation and, and interesting creatures it's it, the ver the, the variation is what's interesting mm -hmm. for sure uh, and the and and the I would I hate to use the word failure because I don't think anything's fail really a failure but the the things that are successful are like wow, and the things that maybe aren't as successful you learn from them or you meet maybe a lifelong friend you never there's always something to be taken away from it. So, so I say so much uh, so much wisdom it. so much wisdom <laughs> and advice so much wisdom and advice you you uh, really truly uh, cannot afford in this business to burn bridges with anybody. It does happen, but uh, you can't really afford it too much. You yeah. really have to be a good person all the way up. I teach my students all the time. The first person you're going to meet going into a studio is going to be the guard. Be nice to them. 
the next person you're going to meet is going to be somebody at a reception desk. Be nice to them. Be nice to everybody. Cause you're correct. Be you never know. Spotlight operator. <laughs> oh, be really nice to the spotlight operator because it's really easy to not put that light on. Oops, you. I missed you. <laughs> <laughs> then you're, then you're, you're running around on stage trying to find that light, which is not the way to go. Karen Ziemba, this has been an absolutely spectacular hour plus on Story Me today. And I, too. I cannot thank you enough for spending this time with me. And, and uh, you know, I hope someday maybe we get a chance to meet in person. Yes. Well, well thank you so much for having me, Steve. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. StoryBeat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden. And may all your stories be unforgettable. <laughs>